Good. So thank you very much, uh, Martin. Um, dear President, uh, dear Chancellor, dear colleagues, um, I'm incredibly honored to be speaking to you here today as part of this very interesting symposium. Um, as Martin said, my topic is indeed a little bit the odd one out here um, because I'm going to take a, a somewhat broader view on the importance of science for society and how science helps in battling these global challenges. Um, so please bear with me for the next 15 minutes. I'm going to take you into outer space and I'm also going to make you look back then at Earth as you see here in this uh, um, slide. So the night sky, it's something that we share everybody around the world. It's available to all, you, everybody can see it. And we can even see it very nicely here with social distancing, um, as you see over here. And everybody who has the opportunity to look up at the dark sky uh, starts to ask the questions, you know, where do we come from and what is our place in the universe? And just to give you a few highlights of how our view of the universe has changed just over the last century. A century ago, we thought that our universe was very small. We thought that we lived in a very small galaxy and that was it. Now we know that the universe is huge. Uh, you see here the fluctuations in the beginning of the universe uh, uh, here from the Planck satellite. And out of these fluctuations, that's what grew into the galaxies that have today. And we live in one of these galaxies. We also thought at that time that most of the uh, universe consists of the atoms and molecules that we can see. Now we know that the bulk of the universe actually consists of this mysterious dark matter and dark energy that we do not yet understand. A century ago, um, we were just starting to test Einstein's theory through the solar eclipse. That's actually a wonderful experiment to teach uh, children about physics and uh, about general relativity. Um, just recently, uh, the existence of a black hole in the center of the Milky Way um, was strengthened by uh, the experiments, the observations were done that actually led to the Nobel Prize a few days uh, ago, uh, measuring the speeds of stars as they go around the center of our galaxy and showing that there must be a very concentrated mass there. And of course, black holes have captured the attention with gravitational waves and this first image of a supermassive black hole um, just again, about a year ago, that was probably viewed by four and a half billion uh, people around the world. A century ago, we didn't know where the elements in our body came from. We now know that the carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen that we have are actually produced here uh, through nuclear fusion in the interiors of stars, and that they are expelled then into the space between the stars out of which new stars and planets form uh, through these supernova explosions. Uh, planets around other stars, they have been speculated about uh, well, for, for centuries uh, since the, the, the Greeks already speculated about them. But the scientific proof that there are indeed planets around other stars did not come until 1995. And that again led to the Nobel Prize uh, in physics uh, last year. We are now starting to understand also how these planets are formed and whether these planets could be habitable, uh, particularly having water. And that also leads to our own solar system. How were we formed some four and a half, six uh, billion years ago? And we're getting uh, clues from that uh, by missions that we now do um, to uh, comets in our outer solar system. That's probably the most pristine leftover material out of which our solar system formed. We have landed on a comet for the first time in 2014. And then here closer by, on these uh, interesting asteroids um, missions there that tell us something about the inner solar system. And so we now know that our sun is just one star in our galaxy, the Milky Way, and that we live on this small planet that is circling a quite ordinary star in the outskirts of our galaxy. And our galaxy, a collection of some few hundred billions of stars, um, and there are some, again, some several hundred billions of uh, galaxies in the universe. So this immediately gives the question, are we alone already uh, a different uh, um, a perspective? So we're dealing with a crisis here at the moment, but a lot of the tools that we have in order to address this crisis come from fundamental blue skies research 
that happened decades ago. If you just think about our smartphone, probably the best known and well uh, advertised example is only possible because of the, the progress that was made in physics, that was made in chemistry, for example, the liquid crystals to um, get the displays, but also in astronomy uh, in terms of Wi-Fi. Uh, discoveries that happened decades ago, but then uh, took a very long time to uh, make it into society. So I think we always need to think about this balance between long-term and short-term applications and gains. Both are important for society. And of course, if you look at our world, we know that uh, even a simple thing as a uh, beautiful sunny, sunny day here uh, in the countryside is, is actually full of these equations of both physics and chemistry that, uh, that make it up. My own topic, astronomy, um, is certainly also an example of multidisciplinary connections everywhere. And uh, not just in the sciences with mathematics, statistics, biology, earth science, chemistry, physics, but also technology, optics, big data. Uh, certainly astronomy has been at the start of big data. Uh, electronics, space. We share big multinational projects. And this is one thing that as a chemist, I actually started out in chemistry and then moved into astronomy. I find that so much unites scientists across the world, these large, infrastructures that we can share. As you see here with our telescopes, especially here, ALMA is an example of a telescope in Northern Chile uh, that is really a worldwide project between Europe, North America, and East Asia to jointly operate, build and operate such a telescope. And the key aspect of this is open data, not just open publications, but all the data after maximum one year become public in open archives that are accessible anywhere in the world. So even if you're not part of this project in Africa or Southeast Asia, uh, you can access these data and work with it. And I think that is also a, a model that I hope will be uh, shared by, by many other uh, uh, sciences. Uh, a little bit about the Vatican Observatory, because they have actually been part of this worldwide connection and worldwide effort since the very beginning. Even uh, since the late 19th century, there was the first World War project, it was the Cartusiel, and uh, it was done here for the Vatican Observatory at Castel Condolfo, a wonderful place to go to uh, there. The modern telescopes are now in Arizona, um, but uh, this was uh, done at that time there, and then Pope Paul VI is here visiting actually the Vatican Observatory and looking through one of the telescopes, in this case at the occasion of the, the moon landing. And I want to pay tribute here to Father George Coyne, actually, um, who uh, was the director of the Vatican Observatory and was very important in this link between astronomy and theology. And uh, the IEU actually named an asteroid uh, in, uh, in his honor. There's the growing importance of the space sector, space for humanity, not just space for astronomy. Telescopes, uh, satellites look down just as much as they look up. It's growing in importance for climate change, for transportation, for agriculture. Um, more and more uh, countries actually investing in space. Um, and again, that's a, a, a very good way also to connect each other. But then there's also the other part, the other part of culture and society, of anthropology, of philosophy, of inspiration, and of education that are so important uh, for science and for astronomy in particular. This is actually a quote um, from uh, Dame Anne Glover, uh, who is a, a biologist, and she uh, was the science advisor to the EU commissioner a number of years ago. Um, and she had this quote, science can liberate. And astronomy in particular is a uniquely inspirational science. You see that small children are more excited by talking about a black hole than they are about talking about, say, a benzene molecule. And so that is why, as astronomy, we are actually investing not just in research, but actually in this education, in communication, and in development uh, around the world. Um, we are an organization with more than 100 nationalities, and we actually have networks of representatives of all of these offices in each of these uh, countries. It's not just promoting astronomy, it's actually using astronomy to make the world better and more inclusive uh, place to attract people into the sciences. And so we do that through education, training and development. 
uh, young astronomers uh, in the developing countries, of course, hands-on training at telescopes at big data, using other planets to show the importance of climate change. Of course, Venus went through a rather catastrophic change, uh, increase in CO2, and uh, it's now, uh, of course, a, a, a very hot planet. Um, and also here using, again, gravity, um, uh, these uh, eclipses also as a way to teach about gravity. And some other examples of educational activities that we had uh, just in our 100 year celebrations in 2019, we reached somewhere between five and 10 million people uh, worldwide with, uh, with our activities. Small telescopes are a wonderful way of attracting uh, people and, and getting them engaged and uh, uh, teaching, about, uh, teaching them about the importance of science. And you can easily bring them anywhere in the world and that, that's indeed we have done through our various programs. And we have now actually uh, in this corona situation special COVID-19 projects where we do a lot of this teaching now online also with planetaria uh, that we can actually have uh, online planetaria shows but also using some of the tools that we have in astronomy like big data in order to help hospitals is analyzing their data or to use some of the equipment uh, technology that we have for uh, building, say, ventilators. I want to spend a few uh, minutes uh, just to talk also about John Barrow's legacy, because John Barrow was supposed to have talked after me, uh, but he very sadly died, uh, passed away just a, uh, um, uh, a little over a week ago. And he, apart from being a brilliant cosmologist and mathematician, uh, also stressed the importance of communication virtual communication and education. And especially around the millennium, uh, he had the change, he had the millennium mathematics program that was hugely successful and that continues still today. In fact, you can still go to the webpage and see everything that he put together. It's a great resource also during the pandemic. You see that here both for primary teachers, for secondary teachers, for students. Um, and then you go, you can go to the curriculum and working mathematically, and there's some wonderful examples here um, that you uh, uh, that you can go. I actually went to one of them, and uh, I saw here actually that in 2000 he had this uh, 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 exercise here on epidemics, uh, modeling with mathematics, um, already trying to have examples to teach children uh, how to uh, interpret these various graphs that you see here on pandemics here, the, the Bombay plague, here actually the Black Death, and here the, the seasonal flu. Um, so I think this is uh, actually, again, a wonderful resource. Uh, in my own, certainly, experience with the uh, statistics that I've seen in the media, uh, just trying to teach people what an exponential is, is already uh, <laughs> uh, not so simple uh, that uh, people forget how, how quickly that uh, goes. Um, one uh, a particular focus is, of course, on using all of this to empower women and diversity. Um, that's something you can do very well through astronomy, also through other subjects. Um, but it's uh, something that uh, we are reaching uh, very significant uh, numbers of uh, people uh, around the world in this way. And we do that uh, through an annual focus uh, in February. Where do we go from here? What is our future? Um, I must show here Martin Rees's book. I can highly recommend it on the future prospects of humanity. Um, he talks about shared hopes and fears, uh, but I think in the end also about optimism. And I like this quote that he makes at the end. The bells which toll for mankind are, most of them anyway, like the bells on Alpine cattle. They are attached, attached to our planet. And it must be our fault if they do not make a cheerful and harmonious sound. Where do we go the next hundred years? Common goals, those are important to unify scientists. Joint facilities, big surveys, big data, new technologies, publishing standards, science policy, diplomacy, science literacy, inclusiveness. And all of this, of course, in a sustainable way. And we should not forget that all this AI is wonderful, but computing also uh, requires quite a bit of energy, so we need to make that also more efficient in, in some way. The computational power grows enormously, uh, but also our data grows. Um, 
if you look just at our own new observatories, um, if we just look at the increase that we will get over the next uh, decades, um, then we, we have to find a way to deal with that. But I think the most important and the most cost effective way of investing in our future is to look at the next generation, especially at the youngest ones. Uh, the ones still in the say um, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, um, that age uh, group. You heard a wonderful speech from Minister Pandor from South Africa uh, just 10 days ago at the United Nations uh, um, event. She spoke about astronomy as inspiring curiosity, about inspiring optimism, inspiring hope. And curiosity, that is of course what ultimately is a driver for innovation. Not an innovation in astronomy, but an innovation anywhere in society. We have to in, in, induce this curiosity in the youngest people. And that is sort of where I think we need to put a lot of our investments. So let me end with two powerful images for society. Of course, the Earthrise that all of you remember well from the Apollo 8. And then this fantastic picture, that tiny little dot there uh, that you see over here. Uh, the picture from Voyager 1 when it was already in the outer solar system and it looked back on Earth and that, that's us, that's our home. Science and astronomy, they provide inspiration, they provide perspective, sense of vulnerability, modesty, if you look at this, and also tolerance. And certainly it brings home the message that we should take well care of our planets and its inhabitants. And so let me come back to Pope Francis' letter on the uh, Fratelli Tutti from the faraway planets that we can now start to image to the needs of the brothers and sisters who orbit around us. So I want to end with this beautiful picture of the Milky Way and remind us all that we're all world citizens under the same beautiful sky. Thank you very much. <laughs>